We start with the, the, the simplest type of dimensionality reduction that exists, which is the linear dimensionality reduction. Mathematically speaking, you can think of it as a linear transformation that takes uh, some matrix in this uh, RP space. So this kind of uh, matrix with, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it transforms your data from P to Q, right? So this is, this is, uh, this is a transformation. This is not the data, uh, sorry. This is the data. So the data is a vector of with P features that after you apply the linear transformation P becomes a vector with Q features, right? And the P in this case, uh, since it's a linear dimensionality reduction and it's a linear transformation, then P is basically just a matrix of Q uh, rows and P columns, right? And then you multiply this with this and you get this. So for example, the first row, uh, I think I have a, I have another one, another slide on this, so I'm not gonna get into that, but we're, we're gonna come back uh, to this. Well, what's the goal of this thing? It's to find the ortho th this, these Q orthogonal vectors, which are linear combinations of the original P features, okay? So it's very important to rem remember this. Every, f in, in the cases of linear dimensionality reduction, since the final space is a, is a linear combination of the original space, then every one of the Q features, and Q is just could be two, could be three, whatever it is that you choose, as the final dimensionality of your data, right? So you start with a hundred or a thousand and then you define, well, you know what? I wanna take this and I wanna make it into a, a, a two dimensional, for example, data set or a three dimensional or five or four or whatever you choose. So whatever you choose, these final, each one of these final features is a linear combination of everything else that you had before. So every new feature that you have is somehow affected by all the previous features that you had, okay? Each one of them. And they are orthogonal. So they, they still form the, uh, a new, let's say, space, a Q, let's say, a Q dimension of space because they are orthogonal, okay? So it's, you find, you, the, the goal is to find these orthogonal vectors, which are linear combinations, and there is, of course, the constraint that these new Q, Q dimensional, or this new Q dimensional space, be it four or five or three or whatever, has to maintain or re retain some structural properties from the original, or else what would be the point, right? For example, uh, as, as you can see here, the usefulness of a projection depends on its goals. Let's take this as an example. This is a data set. It has like two, two very lightweight clusters here, not much, but they're there. Uh, and let's say, for example, I determine a certain projection where I simply, let's say, flatten all these points into this X axis here, or as another alternative, I simply flatten this, this points on the Y axis over here. So which one of these would be a good projection? And by projection, I mean a reduction. You can see here, linear dimensional reduction or projections, they're, they're basically the same thing. Uh, so what's, what would be, what, which one of these would be a good projection? Well, it depends. For example, if my goal is to capture as much as possible the variance of the data, so I want this, this, this new dimension to, to have, to capture as much variance as possible from the original uh, data set, then the middle one is much better than the, the one on the right because I have more variance. I have the, the data, the points are more spread out. I can see, let's say I can see them more clearly while in the, in the right hand side here, they're all kind of like squeezed on top of each other. So uh, you don't see as much variance as you would see in, the, in this one, for example. On the other hand, if I knew that there were two clusters so the red and the blue one, I know that these are the two clusters that I have, then this one is much better than this one. Because in this one, when I projected it onto the y-axis, the red and the blue ones, they were very, well, 
relatively well separated, right? In the new version, the new version of the data set, which is just 1D, kind of retains the separation between these two groups in a nicer way than the, the one in the middle. The one in the middle when, when they were, let's say, projected on the, on the x-axis, they kind of were projected on top of each other. So there's a lot of confusion between the blue and the red points. So, it's, so let's say if you were to cluster, if you wanted to cluster this data set, this representation here would be much better than this one. And you would probably get a much better clustering result from this one than from this one, okay? Uh, so so the, the, the idea here that I want this to, to show to you is that it depends on the goals, right? Depending on the goal of your projection, one projection is better than the other. But again, there is probably no silver bullet that solves everything, okay? Now we're gonna talk about this thing called PCA. Probably you've heard about it and probably you've even used it before. Maybe you knew what you're doing, maybe not. But, uh, but actually PCA is, I can safely say is the most famous or the most well-known dimensionality reduction algorithm that uh, exists. And it's used like everywhere and for, for a good reason. It is, it is a really, really interesting and, uh, uh, idea and it's mathematically sound. It's super well understood theoretically by like, it's been created in more than a hundred years ago. So there's, um, it's just some, it's very well uh, supported right now by in, in all possible way, right? And it can be summarized in this one simple sentence, which is, um, I hope you can see how simple it is. <laughs> so it is, it's an ortho orthogonal projection as we've seen before, but instead of being an orth orthogonal projection into the actual axis, it's an orthogonal projection into a new axis. And we, I will give you an example, an example uh, in the following slide. But it's uh, then, but in, and the way you find this new axis is by taking the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Um, and then you take the ones, the, the, the eigenvectors that are associated with the largest eigenvalues and you choose them as being your new axis for projection. I will, it's, it's okay if you don't understand this very clearly, but I will give you the example in the best way possible. So the goal of PCA is to maximize the explained variance. Meaning the final representation of this thing must explain as much as possible the variance of the original data set, all right? It's a little bit about of what we saw before on the two different projections. Uh, that was just a preview for this. So that's the idea of PCA is, is look, if you are going to reduce the dimensions of your data set, then you might as well do it in a way that keeps the as much as possible, the variance of your data set. Because the more variance you have in the, in the reduced data set, the better you are, you, you can see, let's say you can detect all the uh, different patterns that you have in your data. Because if, if you have very little variance, or if you lose actually a lot of variance, then you're losing the patterns because the patterns come from this variance in this, in this, uh, data instances, right? That's where the patterns are coming from in how these, these different data instances are, are arranged, let's say in the feature space. So if you lose the, the variance, then you lose the patterns. And so the idea that's like, okay, let's just, let's then try to find a way to reduce the dimensions, but at the same time, keep as much as possible all the variance that we have or as much as possible the variance that we had originally. Uh, for example, this is, the original 2D data, let's say you have a 2D data set, you have two features, right? And these are the features you have. Uh, so for example, if you take one, uh, if you take this, this axis here for as a projection axis where you're projecting the points and then the red points here are, are your projected points where you just flatten them into the line, this is the amount of variance you get, right? Something like this that you have in, your, in, in this slide. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a bit, it's, it's quite interesting. It's a lot of variance. You're detecting, you're, you're detecting a lot of variance, but it could be better. Let's say you try again, and then you get a certain axis like this that you see on the slide. And then again, you project all the points into this axis and you end up with the red points. 
you lost a lot of variance. So the previous one was much better. This one is not very good. But still, neither of them is actually the final solution. The final solution is this new axis that is in a diagonal and goes over the, the entire data set that you've seen. So this, this purple, this little pink lines that you see on the um, uh, you know, bottom left and top right, these are the directions of maximum variance. So this is the axis, this is the direction that you should project your data set if you want to have, if you want this final 1D representation to capture as much as possible the variance that you had before. And as you can see here, uh, we're, we're doing like this optimization process where we're looking for, uh, of course, this is just a kind of a little toy example, right? But it's a, it, you could think of it as an optimization process where you start with a random, some kind of direction, whatever, just a random direction that you choose. Then you detect the, the amount of variance that you're, that you're uh, getting from projecting into that initial direction. And slowly you do gradient descent and you optimize this until you get to the final value, which is this one that you see in the, in the end of the animation. You could do that. You can, you can uh, it's, it's, it is possible to determine the derivative and everything and then you can do that. Although usually PCA is done in a much easier way using linear algebra, but you could do this if you optimize for the explained variance. So this is the idea. And, and, and as you can see here, this is very interesting to see the difference between feature selection and dimension letter reduction because feature selection would mean that you have to choose either the X or the Y and, and disregard the other one. While with dimensionality reduction, what you get is this diagonal axis that is actually a combination of, these, of the X and Y, of the original X and Y uh, features. So you don't throw any of these features away, you just combine them into a new one that is the best possible one for your, um, for explaining the variance of your data set. Okay. Uh, yeah. So for example, this is, this is a very common thing that you could do. You could take a, uh, a data set that's in, that's in 3D. In this case here, for example, originally it was in 3D. Then the, this, this uh, PCA process finds the first pr principal component, let's say, which is this one. So that's like the first direction of maximum variance. Then you find the second principal component, which is the direction of maximum variance that is orthogonal to the first one, right? So from first you find the first one and then you find the next one, which is orthogonal to the first one. And this, these two, this first principal component, the second principal component, these are the new axis that you're using to represent your data over here. So first PC and second PC. Right. And now, of course, the question then is like how to find the PC. The, the optimization that we saw here is one way. Uh, it works more like um, just a way to, to teach this thing, but actually it's, uh, it's done through a, like, some very basic uh, linear algebra. But isn't that the same as linear regression? That's some, that's some question that I get sometimes. Uh, that sounds like a linear regression, right? So when you do this, this thing here, it seems like you're trying to find the linear regression between this, this uh, X and Y. So the linear regression of X into Y in order to predict X using Y or something like, or, uh, something like this. Uh, maybe I'm, uh, that was not a perfect uh, that's description, but it's still, it feels like, it looks like a linear regression, right? Where, which is something that you've done before, but actually it isn't. Uh, because with a linear regression, these distances here in orange, these are the things you're trying to optimize, you're trying to minimize. So you want to minimize the projection of your points into the linear regression here by, by looking at these distances that are orthogonal or they're parallel to the y-axis. Because these are the y errors, right? These are the errors of your prediction in, in the y feature. But uh, with the principal component, we do, we also find, well, of course, in this case from 2D to 1D, we are also looking for this, this lower dimension representation, which happens to be a line. But these orange distances here are the ones that we're trying to minimize for. 
and you can see they're orthogonal to the actual uh, axis that you found. So it's not the same. You can see this, this is, these two are the same data set, but you end up with different results. Here you have this line and here you have, oh, here you have this line. Okay, so they're not the same. But anyway, the important part of, of PCA is for you to understand conceptually how it works and more or less how you extract such a thing, even though, of course, you're going to use libraries for this, right? You're not gonna do it yourselves, but it's, it's nice to understand a little bit very quickly about how this thing works, just so you, you get the hang of it, right? So this, the steps are, oh, sorry, the steps are, um, basically to compute the covariance matrix between the features. So covariance matrix is basically a matrix with all the covariances between all pairs of features. So if you have 10, let's say features, then you have a matrix of 10 by 10, where each, sorry, where each, um, where each cell is one covariance between one, uh, one pair of features. So let's say the first cell is the, well, the first cell is covariance between A and uh, between feature one and feature one itself. So that's the, just the variance. But then if, if you take a cell like five, uh, row five, column three, that's the covariance of feature five against feature three, for example. So then you build this, this matrix by just computing pairwise covariances. Then you decompose this covariance matrix into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So this kind of features, this kind of, a, sorry, this kind of covariance matrix happens to be the kind of matrix that can be uh, decomposed into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a very simple matrix. It's square, it's positive. So there are some, uh, some um, let's say, characteristics of this matrix that makes it very easy to decompose into eigenvectors and eigenvalues, which I'm not going to go into details here. I hope you guys have a, an idea of what they are. If, and if you don't, there are many uh, sources of reading that you can do, use. But uh, let's just suppose you understand what is an eigenvector and an eigenvalue. I hope you do. Then basically that's it. And, and, and then you choose the principal components, which are the eigenvectors with the highest associated eigenvalue. So you take from all the eigenvectors that you have, you take those with the highest associated eigenvalues. These are your principal components. So if you're, if you're projecting to 2D, you just take the two eigenvectors with the two highest eigenvalues. And that's it. And then you project your points into these two uh, new axes using orthogonal projection. So it just like what we like what we we're doing here. It's an orthogonal projection because you take the point and then you project it into the line in a way that's orthogonal to the line itself. Okay, like a shadow. Think of it as a as a shadow of the point into the new axis. I'm going to skip this a little bit. I'm going to leave it here in the slides for you to guys if you want to take a look at it later. But uh, it's basically just linear algebra and so on. Uh, and talking a little bit about eigenvectors and eigenvalues here. Again, I hope you guys have a, an understanding of, um, of how it works. I'm not going to focus too much on this because there's a lot of other stuff that we can go through. Uh, you can take a look at this later uh, if you are curious about details about how PCA works. Uh, and this is, this is interesting here, just so you understand, because, you know, in the beginning I said, well, linear, a linear dimensionality reduction is basically a linear transformation, right? And a linear transformation is basically a matrix. And, and ever, uh, since you, when you find the actual uh, principal components, these are the principal components. So for example, the first PC is the first row of your uh, matrix here with B features and then the second PC is the second row and so on. And, and then this is the matrix that you use that you multiply your original data points to get your final data points. So if you, if you multiply the first principal component by the whatever data point you get here, let's say you choose a data point from your original uh, data set, multiply the principal component here, you will get this one first coordinate here. And then if you do it again with a second PC, multiply with your original data point, then you get the second feature here. And that's it. And if, you, if you're only looking for two features, let's say you're, you decided that you want to re reduce the two features, that's it. That's all you need. And then you end up with a Y point here that has two features, this one and this one, which came from the first principal component and the second principal component. Okay. And remember, 
the, the principal component itself is a combination, basically numbers that are used to make a combination of all the features into just one value. So every value is a combination of everything that was existing in the original data set. And it's very interesting to see like, like this, for example, uh, this is a, an example of a reduction from three dimensions to two dimensions. Then you can see that, uh, let's say, consider that you have this original data set here that is in, in 3D. It's a little bit hard to, to, to see, but I hope it's, uh, it's uh, you can actually at least have an idea that this original, originally this data set is in 3D. Then you have the first principal component and the second principal component, and they form this, since they, they are two axes and they're orthogonal, they form this, this plane, right? This 2D plane that's embedded into this 3D space. And then you take all these points and then you project them into this plane. Like I said, it's like a shadow. You take the shadow of these, of these uh, points in the plane. And that is what you see here in the, with the first principal component and the second principal component. This is the shadow, let's say, of these, of these points, which were originally 3D, right? Uh, of course, we, we call this a projection. They're projected into the plane. And, uh, and the interesting thing here is that this subspace here that's formed by these, these two principal components that are embedded in, in 3D, this is theoretically, mathematically speaking, the best possible approximation of the data in two dimensions, for example. So if you choose, if you chose here two dimensions, you can prove it mathematically that this is the best possible approximation of the data in two dimensions, considering, of course, the Euclidean distance here between the original points and the projection plane. Right? Uh, you can you can uh, prove this. So the the optimization process of PCA actually gives you the best uh, Q-dimensional approximation of the data, no matter what is the original data uh, dimension, okay? So you could not do better from the point of view of having the best possible uh, linear combination of these, of these uh, data. So that, that's why PCA is so famous and so useful because basically you cannot do better than this if your goal is to have a linear approximation of your data set. So yeah, it's simple, fast and informative sometimes uh, the characteristics, its characteristics are well known and heavily studied. So it's, you know, it's, it's proven mathematically. Everyone knows how it works, how it behaves, everything. On the other hand, it's usually too simple for complex real world data sets. So as you will see in the next few slides, you will see that when, when a data set is, does not have a good linear representation like this one, when it's, when it's a data set that's so complex, that no matter what linear combination you get, it's never good, then PCA will not work. Simply because the data set itself is too complex for, to be represented linearly. Then you have to start looking for other ways to do it. Uh, yeah, and, and the directions of the largest variance of the data do not necessarily translate to the most discriminative projections. So again, maybe you have clusters in your data, but the way that the clusters are organized is, is so complex that you cannot have a good, good uh, discriminative projection by doing PCA. So you do PCA and then you don't see the clusters. That doesn't mean they are not there because maybe it, it just means that they're, 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 they're arranged in, certain, in a certain way that they cannot be linearly separated. Like what we saw with, for example, k-means against db scan. If you remember, there were this, these uh, clusters that were like one inside the other. So you could never s linearly separate them. So you'd need to use another, for example, db scan. Then db scan can separate them because it does not work linearly. It's not linear. So then you can. Um, it's the same thing with PCA. If you have a data set that's linearly separated or that can be linearly represented in a nice way, PCA will be perfect for you. If you have a uh, data set that's so complex that cannot be linearly separated, PCA will not work. 
then there's some uh, observations here. I'm, I'm gonna start uh, to skip some of the more from of the more let's say obscure details here in order to be able to to move on to some other stuff. Uh, the slides will be available. You can take a look at this. Uh, these more like details that that are also part of uh, using PCA. But one thing that I wanted to show you here is the oh, the impact of the variable scale. So you remember with with the clustering that we that I showed you this comparison between uh, socks and computers, right? Like for example, if you take the same person bought. 10 socks, but one computer. And uh, at the same time, the price of 10 socks is much lower than the price of one computer. So when you take these two features, number of items that you bought and, uh, and the price of the things, their, their scales of the variables are very, very, very different. So that completely um, makes it very hard for the clustering to work. So then what we did was, well, you know, it's, it's very important to normalize these features so that they are, they more or less represent um, a good, let's say, trade-off between the, these two things, right? So they, they kind of like scale more or less in the same way. It's the same thing, for example, in this data set where they, they have, there are four features here. It's uh, a bunch of cities uh, or, okay, so now I'm, I may be, I'm not completely sure if these points here are different cities or different neighborhoods of a specific city. Unfortunately, I forgot to put the, um, the description here, but it's either a bunch of cities or a bunch of neighborhoods from the same city. And then they, they measure, you know, murder, rape, uh, assault, and urban population. So it's um, the scales of these things are different. Like there are many more assault crimes in a specific timeline than there are rapes and, and murders, right? It happens more. And even the urban population, if you just put the, it as it, it is a feature, it's okay, urban population is another feature. Then all of a sudden you have this thing in, 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 the, in the millions or in the thousands, not, not millions for sure, because it's 209, but it's, let's say it's 209,000 people. Again, the scale of this feature is completely different than the rest, right? I mean, can, how can you compare 209,000 with 18.97 of murder? Uh, it makes no sense to compare these two things. And then what you see, if, if, you, if you just take these four features, just apply PCA and then look at the results into two dimensions here, you can see that you get this, this weird little result here where urban population and assault, they are much, oh, this, these arrows here, they, they kind of show in a, in a specific way, they show how much of uh, each of the features are affecting the final result, right? So you could consider it as being like feature importance uh, in, in, in how the, the points are being laid out in this visualization. And you can see that urban population and assault, they pull everything much more than rape and murder because they have these, these very, very, very different scales, right? Um, and I will, um, and then if you actually normalize these features or, or scale them down to a specific, to, to, let's say to the same, more or less the same scale, and you, and you just, um, for example, you scale them between minimum and maximum where you normalize them by, by um, their variance, then you, and then you apply PCA again on top of the new features that you normalize or that you scaled, then you see a much more interesting result here because now urban population, rape, assault, and murder, they more or less have the same importance or the same, um, they affect the results in more or less the same way. Whether you see patterns or not, that's another matter, right? So maybe there are no clear patterns. But, um, but in this case, these arrows here, they kind of point to, to, the, um, to the direction you should be looking at if you want us to see something like, for example, this direction here is the direction of urban population. So you could kind of assume that anything around this area here has low urban population. And as you go up like this way, the urban population becomes larger. And the same with rape, like if you, if you go around here, then you have something that has some places that have low urban population and low rape um, uh, rates and so on. I, I don't really like 
uh, talking about this. Maybe I should change this example. <laughs> it's from the book. So, so yeah, so this is important to show the effects of scaling, okay? I have a question. Is there a way to know with what importance the feature one constitutes in each PC in comparison to feature two? Yes, by coincidence, that's exactly what I'm showing here. Uh, this is from Deepak. By coincidence, that's exactly what I'm uh, showing in this slide here. So I, I cannot talk about this in details in this lecture, but if you look at this reference here that I have, to the right, uh, they're talking exactly about this, okay? So if you read this, this chapter here, you will, find, you will see a very nice way to, to compute this, these arrows here that you're looking at this graph, and they show exactly that, what is the importance of each feature in each PC, okay? 